Well, good morning and welcome to MRCRC Online. We gather online this weekend for worship just a couple days after Christmas. I don't know where you find yourself, but what I want to lead us in this morning is a bit of a different uh, type of service, a more reflective time uh, together for us to really uh, take the opportunity and reflect back on 2020 and all that's transpired. And to do that in a what I'm calling a, a service of remembrance and a service of gratitude. We want to remember, and in remembering, no doubt, lament, but we also want to find gratitude and move towards gratitude and, and even expectation of what uh, this new year might bring for us. And so I'm just going to open us with a prayer, and then we're going to lead into a time of worship, and we'll come back together after that time of worship to uh, just take a journey together of remembering, of practicing gratitude, and reflect on some scriptures uh, together. But let me begin with the word of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this way. We thank you for the moments that we've had in the last few days to gather, uh, to remember your birth, Lord Jesus, to remember your coming into this world and the hope that's been born into our hearts and lives and into this world. And God, as we take opportunity now this weekend to remember, reflect back on this year and, and to practice gratitude together, to look ahead. Holy Spirit, would you lead us? Would you guide us? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, let's worship together. stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh he
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
good for us to worship together. Uh, the songs that we sang hopefully begin to set the stage and prepare our hearts for this time. I've been thinking a lot about this year and all that's transpired and one of the thoughts I've had is I've just been thinking about some of the things that symbolize this year and what this year has brought into our lives. I've got some of those things with me. So the first thing of course is the mask, the face mask. Who would have known that I'd have so many of these, and any of us would be wearing them, and it's really become a bit of a symbol for this year, hasn't it, living through this pandemic. And it, there's something familiar about the mask, and yet, I don't know if you're like me in this regard, but, but every now and then, often it's in a store, let's say, or an area where there's a lot of people, and I just look around and I see everyone wearing a mask, and, and it just kind of still jars me. There's a bit of cognitive dissonance still. There's just a sense of like, what, what world are we in? What has happened? The face mask has been a really striking symbol of this year. You'll notice I have a few candles here as well. I want to light them. The first candle I want to light is, is for all of those that we have loved and that we've lost this past year. We pause uh, to remember their names and many that were known to many of us who are watching this. We think of Aki, we think of Henny, of Diane, of Hans, of Stan, and perhaps there's other names that you would like to remember and faces and their voices. And we give thanks for their memories as well. And we're just going to take a moment to remember them. You notice I have a second candle. We light a second candle. Mindful of the many sources of loss and grief that we've all experienced this year the loss of energy. We can miss the times that we didn't feel exhausted. Exhaustion and weariness is becoming so common and prevalent. The loss of a life without spontaneity. Remember those days that you could just on a whim invite a friend over or go out and grab a coffee or a pint together? The loss of things that happen with ease. Everything has to be planned and structured and I don't know about you but I often say well can I do this and is this allowed and what about this and remember the days that we didn't even ask those questions the loss of life without low-level anxiety the loss of a stable mood the loss of connection the realities of isolation and loneliness boredom are so real so prevalent think back on this year and again we'll take a moment to pause what do you miss from your life as well as we look at these candles we're also reminded of the wildfires that ravaged so much of the West Coast this past year, the loss of habitats, the loss of homes, the loss of livelihoods, the loss of life itself. I brought a book that uh, really gripped me this past year, The Color of Compromise, a story about the American church's complicity in racism. We've been painfully reminded this past year of the persistent and the systemic racism and racial injustice. We deeply lament that it persists and continues in our country as well, in our hearts, in our lives. 
we've also opened up a conversation about our mental health journeys. And so I, I brought this paper that was kind of the cover paper on the sanctuary course. And a number of us uh, took that course back in the spring after COVID-19 uh, had struck us. And it really became an, a, a doorway that we've opened up to walk into and have more honest, more robust conversation about our mental health journeys. All of us have had impacts on our mental health by all that's transpired this year. And we know that the mental health challenges and the journey that we're all on is, is nowhere near over. And as we remember, we lament. We lament. What do, what is, what do I mean by lament? Well, lament is, is a biblical practice. It's a practice of expressing our grief as a way really of, of trying to navigate the kinds of challenges that we've all had to navigate as we reflect back and remember 2020. Throughout the Psalms, we see God's people lament, calling out to God, reminding God, in fact, of his character and reminding God of his promises. Lament is, occurs, you see, in the context of relationship and relationship with God. We lament expecting God to be present a believing that God is dependable, that he's trustworthy, that there's a God who is there to cry out to and protest against. And so we sit with our remembrances and we bring them, we voice them before God this morning. And what I want to do now is I want to read Psalm 42. For those in the sanctuary course, it's become a very familiar psalm to us. But it's a, it's a psalm of lament. It's an invitation. As I read the psalm, I want to invite you to bring your laments for 2020 before God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All of your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let me lead us in a short prayer. God, we, we bring our remembrances, our laments, our grief. We bring it before you. We yet put our hope in you. We yet put our trust in you, yet we still look to you, God. And we lay all that 2020 has brought, we lay it all down at your feet. The weight of it is far too heavy for us to carry, far too much for us to bear. And so would you carry us and carry our burdens, carry our broken hearts, carry our losses, our grief, carry our laments, and carry us, God, lighten the load lift up our hearts and our spirits, renew our trust as we look to you. 
our Savior, and our God. Amen. Amen. We want to move now into a time of gratitude. You know, it's, as I've thought about this past year, I've also not only been mindful of the, some of the symbols I've shared and, and what they represent and the lament and the loss, but I've also been mindful of the many gifts and so thankful for the gifts that this year has brought. And so I want to invite us now to give voice to our gratitude as well. Let me ask you, where have you seen God at work this year? What has God been stirring in you? What has God been doing around you? What has God been doing through you? Where have you seen God at work this past year and might give voice and express your gratitude? So often the times of great challenge become times of tremendous growth. Seeing God do things in us. Where have you witnessed this in your own life? Recently it was in the context of our New Testament course we were reflecting together as a group on that question, and I was deeply moved by what we shared together that night. We shared a growth. There was testimony of a growth in compassion for other people. We all sense that we, we now notice other people, and, and partly it's because of this pandemic, and it's partly because we're trying to keep a distance from others, but, but what's happened through that is this profound compassion that we're just more aware of people that inhabit the space that we inhabit, our neighbors, the people we would see and we encounter people in, in the community, in the stores or restaurants that we attend. There's been a profound growth in compassion. We gave God thanks for that. We testified about a growth in patience. You know, we've all had to wait for so many things this year, things that got postponed, things that got canceled, things that got suspended. Some of us are still waiting for things to get rescheduled that were canceled. And yet through that, God's grown us in patience. A growth in letting go of control. We realize that we're not in control. And we don't have to be in control. God's in control. And that is enough for us. We've grown in accepting our limitations. Not only are we not in control, but there's so much that we don't understand and we don't know. And we don't have to. God knows. And that has become enough. We testified of a growth in humility that's come with all of this. We've testified about more time spent with family, a real unexpected blessing of this past year. We testified about God's provision through a hard year, yes, and through hard things indeed. And yet God has provided. God's been faithful. Let me ask you, what else would you add? Do you take a moment and think about what you can be grateful for as you reflect back on this past year? I hope God has stirred something for you that comes to mind. As we come, as we continue this morning, I, I want to lead us briefly now in a time of scriptural reflection about this practice that kind of grounds this practice of remembrance, lament, and gratitude. And, and I'm going to do that by reading from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. So I thought about this year, as I thought about this service, this passage just came uh, to the surface. I think it's a fitting passage as we look back. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 7 through 12 and then 16 to 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not for, from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, 
so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is God's word. Notice with me a few things about the passage that we've just read. Imagine the kinds of questions that difficult circumstances raise. Uh, Paul, in this letter, is being honest and being vulnerable about the sufferings and the difficulties that he faced in his life. In a few chapters later from where we read, if you move on to chapter 11, Paul will actually catalog the number of things that he experienced. The fact that he was in prison, that he was flogged severely, that he was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked three times. He was in danger from rivers, from bandits, from his own countrymen. He labored and toiled without sleep. He often went without food. He was thirsty. Often he spent a night and day in the open sea. And you can imagine the kinds of questions that were coming at Paul. It would seem that that Paul had an inordinate number of things go wrong in his life. You could just imagine someone who, you know, had gone out in the sea and never been shipwrecked and thinking, well, what's this guy's problem? Why is he shipwrecked three times? Has he not got the right equipment? Does he not know how to navigate the waters? And Paul had an inordinate number of tragedies and sufferings and difficulties. And it would also raise the question of, well, I thought, I thought God was with this guy. Like, how is God with someone who has to go through so much stuff like that? I mean, surely if God's with you, this kind of stuff doesn't happen, right? What's wrong with Paul's God? If it's not Paul's fault, maybe, maybe Paul's got the wrong God. And these kinds of questions were in the air and kind of the context in which Paul's now responding. Notice how he responds. The death and the resurrection of Jesus for Paul has changed everything. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, our suffering is not a contradiction of the gospel, but just the opposite, in fact. It is all confirmation of the gospel. And that's Paul's point here. All of the hard things that come our way become a a way of participating in the death of Jesus Christ. And if we participate in Jesus' death in these ways, we can be certain that if we're united to Jesus in his death, we will be united with him in his resurrection. You see, the pattern that we see in Jesus' life is, is a pattern that will mark the life of those who follow after Jesus. Death leads to resurrection. Weakness leads to triumphant exaltation. Great suffering is answered by resurrection life. This is the case in Jesus' life, and this will be the case for all who follow Jesus. And what's more, it's not just a pattern, but but Paul's also saying here that it's in our weakness, our frailty, our brokenness, much of which is exposed through hard things. It's in those things that God's power is more fully on display. You see, God's power is on display in our lives, not by making us powerful, as if we're some kind of supermen. It's not like that. No, God's power is on display through weak vessels. The power of God, in fact, comes into its fullest strength and is on its most brilliant display when it's displayed through weakness and brokenness. It's what we see again at the cross, that God uses the brokenness and ultimately the death of his Son to accomplish the salvation of the world. His power on display through dying and death, through weakness, through suffering. And Paul gives a list of contrasts that that sort of illustrate this dynamic. Notice with me, we're hard-pressed on every side. I mean, what an apt way to describe this year. It was coming at us from every side. We're relentless. 
pandemic, wildfires, racism, political divisions, protest, conspiracy theories, distrust of those in authority. On every side, we've been hard-pressed. And yet, because God's power is in us, we're not, we're not crushed. The second contrast, we're perplexed, which is a strong word. We're at our wits end. We don't get it. God, God, I don't get it. I'm perplexed. I don't know what you're up to. But because of God's power, we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted. But because of God's power, we're not forsaken. God does not abandon us. Even at the point of death, he is with us. We're struck down, and and even when we suffer physically, God's power is at work so that we know that even in death we will not be destroyed, but raised back to life, and we've seen that and testified to that this year. You see, the treasure of Christ, his power, his death, his resurrection is carried around in clay jars. Weak, fragile, easily chipped, easily broken vessels. And who are the clay jars? That's us. Easily chipped, easily broken, fragile vessels so that God's power might be on display. And the all-surpassing power is from God, you see, not, not from us. See, I don't pretend to understand what God's been up to this year, what his plan has been. I I don't get it. I don't know. But I do know this. I know that God has been at work. I know that God remains at work. I know that God's power has been on display in our weakness, in our brokenness, in our suffering, in our hardships. God's power more fully displays itself. Without a shadow of a doubt, without any hesitation, it is only by God's all-surpassing power that I have made it through this year, that he sustained me. That would be, um, that is my testimony as I remember and think back to 2020. It's only by God's power that we've got this far, that I've gotten this far. And as we think back to all that we remember as we think back to our gratitude that we lift up even in the midst of our lament, we see the power of God on display through all the cracks of the clay, broken vessels that we are. And when we think back to those, those, those moments of gratitude and that, those things that we testify that we've seen God do in us, more patience, more compassion, less need to control, more okay with limitations, I mean, could we not, in those moments of gratitude, join with Paul and say, see, see, all, see this all, all surpassing power, it's from God. It's not from us. Even in a year like this, see what God can do. And then we come upon these stunning verses at the close of our passage. Let me read them again. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, based on outward appearances, Paul seemed weak, perhaps even a failure. And yet, even as he outwardly is physically broken and decaying and being given over to death and suffering, there's this inner transformation that's happening to him that he testifies to. Notice the language. This is a daily reality. Day by day, there's a renewal happening inside of him. See, God's at work transforming. And this comes through a continual fellowship with the risen Jesus and the power of the Spirit, as Paul testifies. See, Paul, what Paul is saying here is just as radical today as it would have been back then. Nobody else was talking this way in the ancient world. Well, maybe we could say that we could somehow be strong and resolute inside in the midst of hard things. 
We'll get through this. Or maybe we could even learn to become a bit more detached from hard things, and so they don't bother us, they don't phase us. You know, kind of just suck it up and don't let it bother you mentality. Or maybe we could take comfort in knowing that the soul is going to survive even if the body decays. But this passage isn't saying any of those things. It holds out something far more glorious and far more stunning. The suffering that we experience can become a source, a source of our inner renewal and transformation. It's through the hard things that inside of us we become renewed, transformed, changed. Let me ask you, what has 2020 done to you? Has it made you more bitter? Has it made you more resentful? Has it made you more angry? Have you grown more distrusting? Have you become more cynical, more afraid? Or, or have you seen inner transformation? Have you noticed that you're becoming more patient, more kind, more gentle, more generous, more compassionate? And if you're honest, you know, maybe you're a bit of both. But do you see, do you see those bits of transformation? Do you see those sparks of God's power at work in you, shining through the cracks and the brokenness? And then we come on the stunning promises from God in the next verse. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The eternal glory that is to come when Christ returns. Far outweighs, Paul says. It far outweighs our present sufferings. It makes them look, as one person put it, like a tiny storm in a teacup. And not only that, but our present sufferings achieve, or we could even say produce, the glory that awaits. The future glory in which all that's been lost will be restored and returned to us, even the life that we've always wanted but never fully attained, will finally be ours in the end. We sang a song at Christmas time. One of the lines goes like this, all the hopes and fears of all the years is found in the Christ child of Christmas. And we could even say, all the hopes and fears of all the years will finally be resolved in the glory that will come when Christ returns in glory. The final restoration of all things, the eternal glory that awaits us, will make every horrible thing that's happened in 2020 seem only like a bad nightmare that's no longer true. As I've said before, all that's happened this year will not get the final word. Not in God's economy not in God's plan. The joy of all things being restored to us, even all that we've lost, having all that we've lost restored, the joy of that restoration will be enhanced because of all that we've suffered and lost. You see, the losses and the sufferings make the joy even greater because we know in the end it will all be restored. It's the ultimate defeat of suffering and evil. The suffering will be swallowed up. Suffering will become the servant of our joy. Our future glory will be enhanced because of all we've been through. And so what has 2020 done for us in the, in the big picture of God's plan for this world? 2020 will make our future joy even more glorious because of all that we've experienced this year and all that, we, all that will be restored and renewed in the end. One day we'll wake up in the presence of our Savior and 2020 will be but a bad nightmare that's no longer true. This is our hope. and This is the glory that awaits us. And so the admonition comes to us and here we close with verse 18 one more time. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary 
But what is unseen is eternal. And so as you think about 2021, there's plenty of things we can see that give reason for hope. A vaccine, perhaps vaccination process, some hope of life returning to normal, uh, some abilities to travel again to remember the times of spontaneity, an expectation and hope of being together again that, that Christmas 2021, I'm not sitting here looking at empty pews. And all good things to look forward to, people that we can embrace again, and be present with physically. But would our ultimate hope not be on the, phys- the visible things that we can see, but that which is eternal, the future glory that awaits heaven and earth becoming one, Christ returning on the clouds of heaven in all his glory, in all life being restored and renewed, and our loved ones being raised to life, and resurrection bodies being all of ours to enjoy an eternity with God forever on a renewed earth. And all that's been lost, restored. And all that never was will be ours. In 2020, we'll have only made that future joy and glory even more joyful and more glorious. This is the hope that awaits us as we look ahead to a new year. Let me pray. God, we thank you for this time together to remember this past year to lament and practice gratitude to also reflect on your word god and to ground our remembrance and gratitude in in these amazing promises christ in us this power on display even in our brokenness and weakness and yet this future glory that awaits us in which all the suffering and hard things of this year will be transformed and not only transform us but will make and our glory and the joy of that future, even more glorious and more joyful. So fill our hearts with renewed hope and strength and confidence, God, as we look ahead to a new year. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. There's a final song that I encourage us to linger with in Christ alone. I can't think of a better song uh, to end this service and to, to stand on as we look ahead to a new year. But the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Be blessed. Sting oh.